Comedy Breaks class. Welcome to week two of uh, Canvas. <laughs> uh, hopefully last week we were able to work out all the kinks needed and we're going to start to get the hang of things. Um, week seven is going to be our drum break section. Um, and we'll go ahead and move forward through there. Make sure if you haven't watched the video uh, for this week, I did give a little introduction video on getting you caught up on what's going on. Um, make sure you watch that. It's going to be at the beginning of this module. Uh, but this week is drum breaks. So we're going to get into drum breaks and how they work, uh, the different components involved. I really wish I had a bunch of components from class with me so I can show you. And I wish that you guys were here with me so I could pass them around and explain to you in a little bit more of a hands-on fashion. But this is where we are at with this stuff. Um, I'm going to try to break the videos down back to 15 minutes. Um, I know I said I was going to last week and I didn't. So um, this is going to be part one of drum breaks. I'm going to go ahead and start the screen share here. You guys should all have this PowerPoint presentation um, on uh, on this module here. I've got it up on as a PDF for you. Uh, so won't you work? Okay. In any moment here, it should. There we go. Okay. So drum breaks. Uh, we're going to talk about the components as well as the operation. Uh, first things. First, oops, I feel like that jumps. I guess not. Uh, so first things first, I want to discuss drum breaks and their advantages and disadvantages. Uh, last class session or last uh, set of videos at the beginning, I talked about the advantages and disadvantages of your disc brake system. Uh, one of the disadvantages was lack of self-energizing, right? Um, the fact that uh, it, it can't apply a little bit and get a lot of breaking action. Um, drum brakes, a specific type of drum brake, actually called duo servo, have the action called self-energizing. So if you look at the picture here, uh, I'm gonna talk about it in a few slides here, but what we're looking at is our front shoe and our rear shoe. Uh, notice here it says primary shoe and secondary shoe. We'll talk a little bit about that soon. Um, but in a duo servo design, these shoes actually have the capability of uh, pivoting. Just a hair, not a whole lot. They're not going to spin all the way around, but they do uh, have a, a pivoting action because down here, um, even though it shows an adjuster, it is not anchored. So the shoes are able to have a little bit of motion there. So when they move out, if my vehicle is moving forward, uh, my primary shoe is able to engage. They're both gonna engage, but the primary shoe engages, or as soon as the primary shoe engages, it wants to turn with the drum, but it can't. It can uh, pivot a little bit, which will actually wedge our secondary shoe up into the top of the drum, creating a whole lot more braking action than what you're actually putting in. So that's really cool. It's sort of like you put in a little bit and you get out a lot. Uh, there is a problem with this though, especially when we do duo servo drum brakes up at the front, we, um, we get too much braking action, more than what we might actually want. And so it can create a lockup in times that we don't necessarily want it. And um, it, it creates some issues. So self-energizing is a pro and a con all in one, um, but that's its number one advantage. On a leading trailing design, if you did your reading assignment, uh, leading trailing designs I'll talk about here in a few slides as well. Um, they do not have that self-energizing action, so that would not be an advantage of that design. Drum brakes are also known for being less noisy, and a big part of this is because you have a big old drum that's sitting on top of the entire assembly. So you get a noise dampening effect as to where with disc brakes, everything's sort of out in the open. And so we get a lot more noise and squeals and things like that with disc brakes. Um, I will say again, because of uh, the design, drum brakes every single time are gonna make a much better parking brake, especially with that duo servo design. Um, but even leading trailing, make an excellent parking brake. Uh, and this has to do with the amount of surface area. And there's two types of friction that we talked about at the beginning of the semester before we uh, had this all COVID scare. Um, I talked about kinetic friction and static friction. Um, 
kinetic friction, the surface area is not going to make a big difference. Uh, but static friction, the surface area can make a big difference. And also we don't have to apply near as much effort to get the amount of static friction back out on a drum brake. On a disc brake, we, we don't have that. So if, for those of you who have ever actually um, converted your rear brakes from drum to disc, uh, I did that on my Honda Civic. Um, when I first did it, I, this was, I'm talking like 2006, it was a long time ago. I didn't have that understanding um, is actually before I took, uh, I think it might've been while I was taking the brakes class. I'm like, oh, you know, I, I really need those rear discs, um, which I did for driving, but I didn't realize how much of a difference it was gonna make on my parking brake. Uh, making my rear disc parking brake meant that my parking brake is now uh, a caliper design. And the first thing I noticed is I had to put in so much more effort on my part in the center handbrake than I normally would uh, with my drum brakes in the rear. Um, <clears throat> they definitely are not as efficient at, at their job as a, uh, a parking brake. Some of the disadvantages for drum brakes, um, we know that some of the fades are a little bit more prominent on drum brakes lining fade and that has to do with uh remember last uh the the disc brake section we talked about <clears throat> excuse me we talked about um there being swept area and that swept area having to do with cooling the more swept area the more cooling i had during operation well since drum brakes have less swept area the lining uh, or the shoes have a tendency to get overheated very quickly, as well as your friction material and all that stuff. So uh, lining fade and mechanical fade are sort of a lot more prominent in drum brakes than they are in disc brakes. And some of you guys might be thinking, well, that's never happened in my rear brakes and their drum. Um, that is, has everything to do with the fact that you do 70% of your braking up front and 30% in the rear. If you had uh, front drum brakes, you would be looking at a very different scenario. Um, you get a lot of pulling and grabbing as well, especially with the duo servo design, not as much with the leading trailing design. <clears throat> um, sorry, I'm looking at my time here, and it seems... Ah. Okay, and I lost my timer. Um, drum brakes are gonna consist of a lot more components than your disc brake assembly. Um, I know there's a lot of names going on here, but I'd like you to notice that there's a lot of spring, a return spring, an anti-rattle spring, a uh, shoe-to-shoe spring. We've got uh, overload spring, lever spring. Uh, another spring up here, I can't read it because my video is in the way. Return, another return spring there. So I'll try to put me up a little bit higher there. Um, so many springs. Uh, some drum brakes have a lot more springs than others. Sometimes you only have three, sometimes you got seven. Uh, it really just depends on the design. Um, but we have the drum itself that this picture does not show, but uh, we know what it looks like because of class before we uh, went online. You've got the drum itself. You've got the shoes on the outside. Um, I will talk more about that in a slide here or so. We've got the wheel cylinder up on the top. Now I had a question in class on the discussion board. If you have questions, please post it. Thank you for y'all who are participating on that already um, because it's, it's already going on really good here. Um, in the first video, by the way, in the intro video, I did mention um, I'm going to change the layout from any questions to weekly questions. That way things don't get jumbled up. So anyways, uh, we had a really good question last week about wheel cylinders, even though it was about drum brakes or disc brakes. Uh, there is only one wheel cylinder in a drum brake, and it's going to be at the top here. Um, down here, we are generally going to have a self-adjuster or an anchor of some sort, depending on the design of drum. Now, all of these components have to have some sort of anchor they have to have something to uh, uh, attach to and that is a backing plate um, the backing plate is going to go uh, against where your axle assembly might be or where the knuckle assembly might be um, it doesn't move it's it's stationary I'll talk more about the backing plate in a few here especially when we get into servicing and lubrication stuff uh, springs, notice I just put springs because some vehicles are going to have 
anti-rattle springs, return springs, uh, shoe to shoe springs, all the overload lever springs, stuff like that. And others may just have just simple return springs uh, and retainer springs. So these retainer springs here that you see right here and right here with my mouse, um, those are going to be retainer springs. Something has to hold our shoes in place um, or else they'll be flopping around and we can't have that. And then we always need to have some sort of return spring to pull the shoes back when you're done breaking and there's no more hydraulic pressure in our wheel cylinder. I'll draw a picture of the wheel cylinder here in a few. I usually pass one around that to cut away. That's really nice, but I don't have that option right now. Uh, and then your drum brakes are always gonna have some sort of adjusting mechanism. I have a slide for each one of these, so I'll show you how that works and when that works. Oh, doesn't wanna. So I'm gonna go ahead and I'm not gonna post or, or show this video right this moment, but I am gonna give you this link in your YouTube video link in, the, in this module or for video resources. Uh, it's a really nice, it's a short video, but it's a nice video that shows you that duo servo action and how that sort of works. Here's another drum brake design though. And then before I get into primary or secondary shoes, uh, nope, we're still good on time here. So we will finish this slide. Uh, our shoes. So we have two types of shoes. Depending if something is going to be a primary shoe or a secondary shoe uh, is going to depend on where the front of the vehicle is. Your primary shoe is always going to face toward the front of the vehicle. Your secondary shoe is generally going to face the rear of the vehicle. Um, on a duo servo design, the primary is always going to be smaller. Um, and it's actually only for engaging the brake. It's not actually doing most of the braking. Your secondary shoe does that because it gets wedged up against the drum. Uh, also, by the way, uh, we had a really good question in the discussion board about uneven wear of the shoes. It's actually quite common, especially on duo servos, to have uneven wear on your shoes. The uh, top of your secondary shoe has a tendency to wear a whole lot faster than your bottom, so on and so forth. Um, and especially because of how our shoes engage because our wheel cylinders up at the top. Um, on a leading trailing design, which I'll show you in a few, the primary shoe and secondary shoe are the exact same size and then they do the exact same amount of work um, because of the design uh, and where the anchor is at and all that good stuff. So that is what our shoes are laid out. Uh, there are two parts of our shoes. So we actually have the lining material here if you're following my mouse on the outside. And then um, I've got this webbing on a backing plate. So this whole piece here where my spring attaches to here and here, that's all part of the shoe. It doesn't disconnect. Our shoes are generally mold bonded or riveted to that backing plate and webbing. So just keep that in mind. Um, the, some things to look for is cracking in your lining when you're taking the drum off. You're looking for bent webbing, any damage at all to the shoe that doesn't look like it's supposed to be there, cracked webbing, any of that good stuff. Here's our leading trailing design. It looks very similar. We still have a wheel cylinder up on the top. I'll talk about wheel cylinders here in a few. Um, we have an adjuster. The adjuster on this particular leading trailing happens to be up right under the wheel cylinder um, to adjust our shoes outward or inward. Again, if um, my shoes wear out, they need to move out further. Um, so we need to have some sort of adjusting mechanism in our drums. Um, the differences on a leading trailing is some light vehicles like Honda Civics or Camrys, uh, any of your economical vehicles, generally have a leading trailing design. And the reason for this is because uh, a leading trailing design does not do as much braking or is not as good at braking as duo servos. And you might think, well, why would you want that? Well, especially with lighter vehicles, I can very easily over brake in my rear, even with the smallest amount of pressure. And so duo servos would lock up the rear wheels all the time. So we don't do that anymore. Instead, we, uh, instead we'll put an anchor down here at the bottom. 
And what that means or what that does for us is it keeps the shoes from doing that duo servo action. They stay in place and they just move outward and inward. This allows for some breaking, but not near as much as a duo servo design. And because we don't have that duo servo design, we can make each pad, uh, or I'm sorry, each shoe equal length. Uh, I will tell you that a lot of the time, one shoe will wear out a lot faster than the other. Um, on a customer's vehicle, please do not be tempted to take the shoes and just flip flop them because a lot of times the part number may even uh, be the same. And you're like, well, one is wearing out faster than the other. Why not just flip them? Do whatever you want on your vehicle, but on a customer vehicle, that's not good practice. So I'm just throwing that out there because I saw that a lot uh, in the field. So um, not, not good practice. Uh, before we get into types of drums, we're past our 15 minute mark. So I wanna go ahead and uh, just stop the video. So we can, uh, I'm just gonna break it up a little bit and see if it works any better. So I'll stop share. When we come back, I'll talk about different types of drums. <laughs> 